Welcome to fabulous Las Vegas, um, but more importantly, welcome to the 28th uh, Cervical Spine Research Society Instructional Course Lecture. Uh, my name is Michael. Uh, my name is Jason Savage from the Cleveland Clinic, and I have the pleasure of co-chairing this session with Max Mayoki from University of Louisville. Thanks, Jason. We have a couple of uh, uh, short talks, and then uh, we'll go into a case debate. Okay, to, we're going to get into the uh, debate section of our morning. Um, can you load up the case, please? So our case here um, is a 67-year-old male presenting with the complaints of neck pain that radiate into his shoulder blades, numbness and tingling into the hands, and difficulty with balance. This is a sagittal MRI view of the patient. Here are some routine x-rays, just an AP and a lateral showing you know, uh, slightly kyphotic to low, uh, neutral spine. Here are the axial views for his pathology, C3-4, C4-5, C5-6, C6-7, showing varying degrees of spinal cord compression. So in the great spirit of CSRS debates, trying to keep this as friendly as possible, we have three of the greatest stooges coming up here to debate. So without further ado, let me bring up Dr. Mraz, who's going to present the pros and cons of multi-level ACDF for cervical myelopathy. Thanks, Andy. It's a real pleasure to be up here this morning. Uh, thanks for everybody for attending. Um, once my talk's loaded, uh, you know, I'm going to say as a disclaimer as I go into when I see a patient who's got multi-level myeloradiculopathy, my go-to is going to be a laminoplasty all day long, every day, because I think it's a great operation. You maintain their motion. They don't lose, oftentimes, their sagittal alignment, and they're generally happy, happy patients, even if they have radiculopathy. But I'm going to present a rationale, though, for this particular patient where laminoplasty by far and away is not the right option. And you'll hear a lot from my colleagues, you know, the esteemed Dr. Sue and Dr. Uh, Patel from Northwestern. I've, I've worked with both of them for many years now, and Dr. Sue in particular probably will have, this, he'll, you know, enter in some distraction, uh, some, uh, perhaps some photoshopped images, what he thinks is me when it's really not me. Um, anything to distract you from the from the, from the topic at hand, but I will, pre I will present to you an irrefutable evidence that laminopla or laminoplasty and laminectomy infusion is absolutely the wrong option for this particular patient. I do have some, uh, some uh, conflicts of interest uh, not pertaining to this talk. I get royalties from Stryker. I'm a deputy editor for G uh, GSJ and on the board of CSRS. So we've heard about this talk, but I want to pay particular attention to a couple of things in the, in the history. The patient has axial neck pain, and I'm going to assume for a minute that this patient is not just a radicular type of neck pain. You know, oftentimes we see that. Patients get radiculopathy, do you have neck pain? Yeah, my neck hurts. Where? It's over here. It's not really neck pain, but I'm going to assume for a second this is axial neck pain, and looking at the x-ray, it probably makes sense that it, in fact, is axial neck pain, which is longstanding, predating as clinical neurological syndrome. Radiates into both shoulders and shoulder blades. Typically both, that means bilateral. Typically that's going to be C6 if it's radiating to the shoulder blades, but he also has numbness and tingling in the hands, which would implicate C6 or C7, possibly C8, but it's not going to be C8 in this particular patient. So four different nerve roots, both sides. So at minimum, you're going to have to address that with whatever surgery you're going to choose. Now, it's going to be hard preoperatively to differentiate between a C6 and C7 radiculopathy because oftentimes they follow. There's cross innervation. Dan Bruce talked about that. He's published on that. There's no ambiguity in the literature about whether or not that is, in fact, true. So just keeping that in mind, and he's obviously got uh, – this is awesome. So we can move forward. You've already, you've already seen the case. But what this patient has – I've memorized it – patient has – Central stenosis at 3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7. He's got some effacement, no displacement, or do, nor, no deformation of the cord. He's got foraminal stenosis at 5, 6, 4, 5, and he's also got foraminal stenosis on the left side at C6, C7. So let's start whether or not there's a difference between anterior and, uh, anterior and posterior um, surgery for a myelopathy or myeloradiculopathy. This was a study that came out of AO spine. Uh, back in 2013, prospective observational multicenter trial, 246 patients, level two evidence, anterior versus posterior, very clean cohort of patients. And what they found is that there is no difference whatsoever in MJOA, uh, NERC score, or any of the functional outcomes that they studied in this particular study. So there's no difference between anterior and posterior surgery. And this has been 
re uh, replicated over the many years since then by a multitude of different trials, and we'll go over them. JBGS, uh, High Impact uh, Journal, 2017, same sort of thing, uh, looking at anterior versus posterior surgery. Uh, this is a pro pro propensity matched cohort analysis, and what they found was that they're, again, looking at the things that they looked at, operating time, length of stay, uh, MJOA, recovery rate, NDI, SF36, PCS, and uh, MCS, there's no difference between the anterior and posterior uh, approaches for myelopathy. And that was Dr. Failing's study. He's in the audience. He will tell you that there's absolutely no difference between anterior and posterior. So regardless of what Dr. Sue and Dr. Patel tell you, there's no difference. Anterior surgery is not inferior. So. The other study I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about is Dr. Gogo Wallace's study. This is the highest level of evidence we have looking at anterior versus posterior surgeries. It was a randomized controlled trial. Uh, first, uh, making sure that the patients had clinical equipoise. Uh, there was two plus level core compression with myelopathy. The primary outcome was one year follow up with um, SF36 PCS scores and secondary outcomes of a variety of different things. And what they found was that the primary outcome, there's no difference. Again, replicating what we already know, there's no difference between anterior and posterior surgery. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, functional outcomes or quality of life outcomes. Uh, however, in the anterior surgery, and they may say that the patients are going to end up with a peg tube and all these other things, it's not true. There, there is a higher incidence of patients who have dysphagia. We know that for a multi-level surgery, but if you do the surgery properly, a proper exposure, the patients don't have long-lasting dysphagia, and it's really, it's, it's minimal at best. Again, for evidence from 2023, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that anterior and posterior surgery, this is just from this year alone, are equal in terms of the functional and quality of life outcomes. Um, these two particular studies uh, also looked at um, anterior surgery, and they noted that it had lower surgical uh, infection rates, reduced blood loss, shorter length of stay, as well as higher uh, home discharge. And you know, we, as we know, moving into 2023 and beyond, it's really important to get the patients home. So there are other advantages for anterior uh, approach to multilevel surgery. You get better correction of sagittal alignment, and I will tell you in just a few moments that in this particular patient, it's going to be very important. Less preoperative, postoperative pain, possible more thorough foraminal uh, decompression. I think that's important that we consider that because if this patient's got radiculopathy and you just do a myelopathy surgery from the back, they're not going to be very happy if they still have numbs and tingling or pain in you know, one or both arms. And a lower uh, C5 palsy rate with anterior versus posterior, there's, it's Somewhat debatable, but the majority of evidence suggests that there's a higher C5 palsy rate with posterior-based approaches. Uh, Multi-level anterior uh, disadvantages, you know, I like looking at both sides of the coin. Certainly, multi-level surgery has a higher non-union rate. And if you look at Fraser and Hartle paper in tw uh, 2007, which was a meta-analysis, they had 82% non-union rate in patients who had uh, uh, fusion levels at th of three levels. And, dy and dysphagia, I think, if you do a proper exposure, a good caudal cranial exposure, and uh, making sure that you have good uh, expo uh, excursion of the tissues, uh, dysphagia rates are nominal. And with regard to the non-union non rates, which we know do exist with multi-level surgery, two grafts in each individual disc space or using a different type of graft where you fill the entire disc space probably will help equalize the, the uh, rate of non-union. But let's just think about a laminoplasty. If you do a laminoplasty on this patient, you're going to have to do bilateral foraminotomies at 5, 6, and 6, 7. If you're going to adequate, if you really care about this patient, you're going to have to address the radiculopathy at all four nerve roots. Um, this patient's SVA, while it's not measured, and I can't measure it, just looking at it, um, we can say that it's probably at or greater than 4 centimeters. We know that patients who have an, um, a, a cervical SVA greater than 4 centimeters have higher incidence of neck pain postoperatively. And I would bet this patient 67 years old. I bet this patient globally is sagittally positive, which in my opinion, in my experience over 20 years of operating, uh, typically, patients who do laminoplasty and those types of patients who are forward, but they're a little lower dosis, uh, and their cervical spine typically have unfavorable um, results with regard to neck pain. And this patient does have neck pain, which in the classical sense is a contraindication for doing a laminoplasty in the first place. Moving on to laminectomy. Again, you're going to have to address all foraminotomies. I think if as long as you feel comfortable doing foraminotomies at four levels uh, while you're doing a, a laminectomy infusion, I think that's okay. But you're going to knock out 50% of this patient's motion. Now, if you're 67 years old, you just retired, you want to hang out with your wife, go on some vacations, but you're, you're going to be limited by 50% of your preoperative motion. It's probably, I wouldn't want that. I really, really wouldn't want 50% of my motion knocked out. And I think this is excessive surgery for this particular problem. This patient's got three-level disease, but you're going to address from C3 to C7 or C7 to T1 or C2 to T2, whichever you like. That's more surgery than this particular patient needs. And if this is your dad or is your uncle, I'm certainly not going to do it on them. So finally, I think if you care about this patient, a C3 to 6 ACDF is the most appropriate 
patient. This patient, again, has neck pain. It's an easier and quicker foraminal decompression. I would bet everybody in the room is, is comfortable with an anterior approach, taking care of the nerve roots anteriorly, going out to the pedicle anteriorly. And this patient has a high S, uh, cervical SVA, and you will, be, you will be able to correct this from an anterior approach, and this patient will have a quicker recovery. So I think the evidence is irrefutable. Now, I do say that laminoplasty is a great operation, and Wellington or Alpesh, whoever's talking about that, they're going to be right. It's a great operation, but not for this particular patient. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? Um, one thing that you guys uh, didn't really touch upon in all your debates is, uh, do you think there are differences in C5 palsy rates with the different procedures? Yeah, so complications, I think it came up a little bit. I, I, I know Tom mentioned, or I think maybe Wellington mentioned, that there's this thought that there's an equivalence in C5 palsy rates uh, between anterior and posterior. I don't know that that reflects what I've seen in practice. Um, I think in the setting of corpectomies, you, you can see C5 palsies, but ACDFs are pretty rare. Um, the other component, and if, if Zoe's in the room, you know, his paper that came out last year suggested a lower complication rate with laminoplasty. Uh, and so it may have something to do with mitigating the amount of canal expansion that occurs. But I don't think we have a definitive answer. Wellington, Tom? I think the literature is mixed. I've seen, personally, I've seen C5 palsies anteriorly and posteriorily with levels of surgery involving C4-5. Um, but a lot of the literature seems to focus on posteriorly based approaches, but I see, I've seen it anteriorly and posteriorly. Tim, what do you think? Wellington says. <laughs> what I was going to say, I, I think it can happen in both, and we have to recognize that. But I think the body of literature suggests, Andy, in the last 10 years that uh, posterior is higher. Michael. Uh, Michael Failings from uh, Toronto, no uh, conflicts to, uh, to report. So I enjoyed the discussion. I think um, <clears throat> one of the challenges uh, in, in the interpretation of some of the prior literature, including some that I've contributed, is that we've kind of lumped everybody with degenerative cervical myelopathy together. But the reality is, is that you know, we're heading toward personalized management approaches. And I think what's emerging is that if you're going to operate with patients with mild myelopathy, particularly those that are, have pain, uh, that may influence your decision making. I can, I can share with you kind of my own thoughts on this, but I'd be interested in all three of you. Let, so let's say that this individual was coming to you with minimal myelopathy, but kind of a lot, you know, kind of neck pain and a lot of arm pain. How would that have uh, influenced your d decision making? What, what, which of those three options do you think would work best in that circumstance? You know, I, I, so I would be the first to say if in that scenario, I'll probably more likely go anterior uh, because you're moving the pain generator. You're, you're probably trying to get rid of the radicular, you know, uh, uh, component of it. And the myelopathy is is not the first and foremost, although you have to treat it, it's not the first and foremost uh, issue. So, yeah, I think that changes my sort of view of that. You know, I, I think, you know, this guy's got multi-level stenosis and he's got spondylosis throughout, globally throughout his cervical spine. I mean, even if we do a three-level ACDF on him, we're not going to be able to tell him exactly, well, your pain's not going to be as bad, you know, because this pain may be coming from a cervical thoracic junction, which is going to be left untouched. However, I think in patients who have a preponderance of neck pain, and I don't think that it's ridiculous, uh, and they have a preponderance of a radiculopathy, I'd go anteriorly, you know, rather than doing a laminoplasty. You know, as Ed Benzel oftentimes says, not all motion is good motion. And in patients who have, you know, a lot of degeneration and, neck and you know, axially related, axially based neck pain, not radicular pain, you know, that pain oftentimes will get better with effusion and oftentimes can be exacerbated if you maintain that motion at the affected level, surgical level. Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd maybe build on that and say, Dr. Failing, to your point, you know, we tend to lump myelopathy. We also tend to lump neck pain. And I think we've had discussions at CSRS meetings in the past that one neck pain is not the same as another. Um, and so I think we get to the point of where do we think the generator is coming from? And, and in a setting of radiculopathy, I think we've got data that supports improvements in neck pain when you do surgical intervention for radiculopathy. But in a primary neck pain scenario without substantial neurological involvement, that's a real tough one to to feel like we know exactly where the generator of pain is. Yeah, fair enough. And I, I guess what, what I was kind of driving at was that we've done a reanalysis of, you know, the data sets that we previously reported on, kind of from the, the lens of looking at the mild group, and it does appear that the anterior surgical approach is superior in those There you patients. go. Yep. Just, by, just before you get to Zoe's question, by a show of hands, who here wants to do an anterior procedure? Who wants to do a laminoplasty? 
clubhouse leader so far? Who wants to do a laminectomy infusion? Who's not voting? Oh, it's over then. It's, it's over. pretty. It's Powerful. pretty evenly divided here, so it's a, a good case for for debate. So, yeah, just a couple of things. Just to follow up on uh, Wellington's point about the uh, the um, uh, CSM trial, we did see less um, uh, C5 palsy in the laminoplasty uh, cohort for sure. But at the end of the day, those are small studies, and the question that I wanted to bring forward is that. Um, for some of these questions, you know, you need large uh, uh, data sets. And uh, uh, Praveen uh, Mumanini and his um, QOD group um, published on uh, neck pain after laminoplasty and laminectomy infusion and um, showed, I think, quite convincingly that neck pain improves regardless of whether you do a laminoplasty or laminectomy infusion, and they're the same um, uh, post-op. Large populations of patients, they didn't have flexion and extension radiographs on all of these things. But as the three of you were formulating your um, arguments, um, with that kind of data coming out of QOD, how critical is it to really make a decision on the presence or absence of neck pain, not m knowing much more about it than that? You know, I, from my perspective, I think neck pain is, is oftentimes, I wouldn't say it's, it's confusing uh, or it's confused within the literature, but you know, I've had patients who have a radiculopathy who are younger patients who say they have neck pain, but when you dig into it, as I said in the talk, they have pain over here in the trapezial region, it's referred pain, it's not true facet-related pain. And so in those studies and that re registry, as an example, that may, they may not be delineating between that because they, I think the only way that you can do delineate that is you get a highly, highly selective nerve root block with anesthetic only of 0.3 cc's or you do an intraarticular facet joint block to see whether or not, what, what is that, neck pain or is it radicular pain? But from my perspective, I think, uh, I don't think that particular study changes how I would approach this. And, you know, as I said, this patient's got a relatively high T1 slope. The patient has a C4, you know, a cervical SVA, which is on the borderline, if you believe Tang's article, you know, but I do think, you know, in patients, in, and this is just level five evidence. In, in my experience, I think patients who are globally sagittally positive and you do a posteriorly based approach, particularly laminoplasty, I'm not saying they're an overt failure. I just don't think that they have as good as outcomes as somebody whose head is over their pelvis. You know, we're launching a study at the clinic to look at that, where so we're getting all, you know, global, you know, the sagittal views. We're getting, you know, in addition to the cervical x-rays to try to elucidate that. But I still don't know. But this is my gestalt. Right, yeah, one I, last question before we... Uh, thanks. Sure. Uh, Greg Schroeder from Rothman. Um, no pertinent disclosures. Uh, so, Wellington, on your decision algorithm, you had at like more than two levels to go posterior. I, mean, I go anterior on three levels all the time. Alan goes anterior on four levels a hell of a lot of the time. Uh, like, I guess to me, like that's kind of the difference, right? If, I think a three-level ACDF is much better than a laminoplasty or a lam effusion. But if I have to start getting into four and five, that, then that's different. So is two really the number that you think, or do you think it can kind of change? Uh, so good point. So two level, I would do anterior for sure. Four level, I would do posterior in general. Okay. Three level is sort of like the um, the witching sort of you know uh, scenario. I think the point to your question is a very important one. How fast you do an anterior operation is a very important uh, factor in uh, op you know outcomes and complications. I'm always trying to evaluate that. What I would have done my first year in practice is different than what I would do now 15 year. I have no problem going three level anterior now as well. But I also think that if you're older and 80 years old. The, uh, you know, the complication rate may, is certainly going to be higher anteriorly than it is if you're 50. And so that goes in my algorithm as well. Perfect. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Nice work.